Shalom and Happy Chanukah. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Miketz, the 10th Torah portion in the book of Breshit, Genesis, beginning with chapter 41. Parshat Miketz is just about always read on a Shabbat that falls during the holiday of Chanukah. As everyone knows, this month of Kislev is known as the month of dreaming. And one reason for this is because the Torah portions of Genesis that mention dreams are all read during this month. Our portion of Miketz chronicles Yosef's rise to power, quickly becoming second only to Pharaoh himself, all ostensibly on account of his interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. I say ostensibly because God had his plans for Yosef. It's like Yosef had a dream, which he had told over to his brothers, that caused them to hate and shun him. But Hashem himself, as it were, had his own dream for Yosef, and that was for Yosef to become elevated above his brothers and above the entire world through Pharaoh's dream. Indeed, this month of Kislev, and the holiday of Hanukkah in particular, is about actualizing dreams. But what does it take on our part to make a dream come true, to make God's dream for each one of us come true? The story of Yosef's alienation from his family and his unjust suffering in an Egyptian prison is a story marked with such real tragedy, so much pain here of everyone involved, Father Yaakov, Yosef, and yes, his brothers. It's unbearable, family dynamic. Can we even imagine the anguish and despair that Yosef must have been feeling while in prison? And when the cupbearer first recalls and relates to Pharaoh that Yosef exists, he refers to Yosef in a degrading, unappreciative manner, a Hebrew youth, a slave, who correctly interpreted his dream and that of the chief baker two years prior to this. So Pharaoh immediately sends for Yosef. Yosef is released from jail, gets cleaned up, and finds himself standing before the king of Egypt. Now open up your hearts in the deepest way. Though Yosef has been in an Egyptian slammer for, according to the reckoning of Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, for 10 years, for a crime he never done, though his own brothers betrayed him and sold him, though he sorely missed his father and thought he would never see him again, in spite of all this, what's the first thing out of Yosef's mouth? What's the first thing Yosef says to Pharaoh? It is God who will provide the interpretation, not me. So it's clear that Yosef might have felt abandoned by his nearest and dearest kin, but he never felt abandoned by God. What's that verse of King David's in Psalms 27, verse 10? For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but Hashem gathers me in. Yosef obviously felt Hashem's presence at every moment, and through every twist and turn of his life, even in the midst of the misery. So he knew that when he opened up his mouth to interpret Pharaoh's dream, all he was doing was providing the throat for the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, to speak. But we can identify with Yosef's pain, with all this insufferable pathos. He was betrayed by his brothers, felt abandoned by his father. Which one of us has not felt betrayed or abandoned at times? But to find Hashem in it, like Yosef, aye, there's the rub. But now the tables have turned. Yosef's divinely appointed destiny begins to unfold quickly as he interprets Pharaoh's dream and is appointed by Pharaoh to a position of spectacular authority over all of Egypt. Yosef's interpretation of the dreams proved correct, and the famine spread over all the face of the earth. All the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy provisions. And thus did the sons of Israel come to buy provisions among the arrivals, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Although Yosef recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. So Yosef was freed, freed from prison, correctly interprets Pharaoh's dream, and on that very day, he was made royalty. And our sages teach that this day was none other than Rosh Hashanah. The day he was freed and took charge of Egypt is the day that the land of Egypt began to be blessed. The very grain was blessed. And Yosef, with great wisdom, with compassion, humility, and understanding, he built storehouses in every city, and filled them with every type of grain and produce, sent out word to all of Egypt, by order of Pharaoh, prepare yourselves for the upcoming years of famine. He gathered 
inestimable amounts of food, so much that it could no longer be counted, the verse says. And when the seven years of famine began, as Yosef had said they would, descended immediately and suddenly in one fell swoop, while the Egyptians were still at the table, the bread in their tables rotted, the flour wormed, all the grain that was privately stored rotted. All this, of course, explained in the Midrash. Everything went bad except what Yosef himself had saved. You have, to, you have to stop for a second here. I'm sorry, there's something on my screen. Just read what's on my screen. I can't read it. It's some kind of a warning. Dell Support Center, scheduled hardware scan, run later. Just do all or cancel. I can't read from it. Tell me Select where to press. This that. one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me take this, take this um, back here. I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. All this, of course, explained in the Midrash. Everything rotted except what Yosef himself had saved. So the famine reaches epic proportions, and all of Egypt came to Yosef to buy provisions. Now, if an Egyptian citizen himself tried to store food, it would only rot away. It was Joseph's purity and righteousness that preserved all of Egypt's provisions. It was him, him himself. And on account of his purity, he was able to sustain the entire population and ultimately that of the world. No wonder in a reference to Yosef's attribute of purity, our sages state, the righteous Joseph is the pillar of the world. So the famine spreads all over the earth, reaching the land of Canaan as well. And in the second year of the famine, Yaakov sends Yosef's brothers to Egypt to buy food. The brothers come down to Egypt to seek provisions and things begin to heat up. They come before Yosef and bow down to him, not knowing who he is just as he saw in his boyhood dream. He recognizes them, but they do not recognize him. And Yosef devises an elaborate plan to test his brother's love for each other, to ascertain if they have repented, if they've overcome their sin of baseless hatred. He accuses them of being spies, imprisons Shimon, supplies them with grain, and sends them home to Canaan while warning them that he will only receive them again if they bring their brother Binyamin, Benjamin. He sends them home with their money, surreptitiously return to their sacks. And when the brothers return home and Yaakov hears the man's demand to see Binyamin, the child of his old age, he refuses to send Benjamin, saying, You have bereaved me. Joseph is gone. Shimon is gone. Would you take away Benjamin? Upon me it has fallen. 42 and verse 36. But when their supplies are used up, Yaakov agrees to send Binyamin after Yehuda accepts responsibility for his welfare. Now everybody knows what happens next. The brothers arrive in Egypt and are again brought before Yosef. He frees Shimon. Yosef has a hard time hiding his emotions upon seeing Binyamin and goes off into a side room to cry. Sits with his brothers for a meal and again supplies them with much grain. But he gives instructions for his silver goblet to be hidden in Binyamin's bag. The men were sent off the next morning, but upon Yosef's instructions they were pursued and apprehended right outside the city. They were accused of stealing the goblet, and they vigorously denied this, saying that whoever took it should be put to death, while the others will be the master's servants. The men are searched, and the item was found in Binyamin's sack, in whose possession the goblet was found, must remain, remain as Yosef's slave. This is what was declared. The other brothers could return to their father. Yosef sees that Judah's response to the crisis of Benjamin is quite different than what it was when the brothers were all aligned against him. This time, Judah acknowledges this as divine retribution for the earlier sin which the brothers committed against Yosef. Now, I ask your forgiveness. Forgive me, please, but I need to go back to last week's portion of Vayeshev because I'm hung up on something. I'm still thinking about one of the most difficult verses in last week's Torah portion, and the truth is that everything that we just summarized, everything that's happening now in our portion of Miketz is a direct continuation of those events we learned of last week that were set in motion in Parshat Vayeshev. And I need to talk about this now in order to understand what's going on. You see, as we read in Miketz, as we read in this week's Torah portion, chapter 42 and verse 6, we read the words, Yosef is the Majbir. Translated as, Yosef is the viceroy, or the ruler of the land. That's a sorely insufficient translation because the root of that word, mashbir, 
is shever, which means food, provisions. Versus saying Yosef was the provider, the feeder, the source of food. That was divinely ordained, that this should be his role. As I mentioned, it was on account of his purity, that he was able to be the mashbir. But let's endeavor to get a clear picture, the whole picture, of Yosef's role in Egypt as the provider. So back last week in Parshat Vayeshev, chapter 37, we learned of the brothers' conspiracy against Yosef. Like they said here in the month of Kislev, the month of dreams, they said, here comes that dreamer. <laughs> Let's see what's going to be with his dreams now. They take off his garment, throw him into a pit, and then, in a verse that's just so difficult to comprehend on a simple level, chapter 37 of verse 25, they sit down to eat. <laughs> Remember, that there is the way things appear and there is the way things are. <clears throat> we know that the Holy Brothers, the tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, the tr you know, they're not ruthless highwaymen, though it seems like they acted as such. We know that on the deepest of the deep levels of understanding, there were vast spiritual issues of contention between Yosef and his brothers regarding how to serve God in this world and let his light in and how best to be agents to bring about the ultimate redemption. We know that differences in understanding and approach to these core issues were at the heart of the discord between Yosef and his brothers. Not that such discord can therefore be excused, but this is not a simple case, you know, of uh, pettiness or petty jealousy or sibling hatred. But in that verse, chapter 37, verse 25, we read, and they sat down to eat a meal. They lifted their eyes and saw, and behold, a caravan Ishmaelites was coming from Gilad, and their camels were carrying spices, balm, and lotus, going to take it down to Egypt. Vayeshvu le'echol lechem literally means, and they sat down to eat bread. <laughs> what does that even mean? How am I supposed to take that? They, they threw the brother into a pit. Presumably he was wailing, begging them for mercy, petrified with fright, and they sat down to eat. Like, gosh, they really worked up an appetite. You know that the Torah is exceedingly specific, doesn't waste words, and is also exceedingly specific in what we need to know for our lives, for our life lessons. What we need to understand is an important perspective regarding the dynamic between Yosef and his brothers and the repercussions of their dysfunctionality, repercussions which spread out like concentric circles having an effect on everything, in fact, for all time. So in a deep comment, our sages employ poetic license and a play on words, that, and they teach, not literally, but homiletically, this is an, uh, a level of Torah interpretation, they say, read these words as a code, change the order of the letters around, and read it not as vayeshfu le'echo lechem, they sat down to eat bread, but they sat down la'achil lechem, to feed bread to feed bread to the entire world. That through their action, the world would be nourished, would be provided for. So what's the idea here? I quote from the Midrash Rabbah. Listen carefully. I quote, Said Rabbi Yehuda Halevi Be Rabbi Shalom. As a result of the brothers getting together and coming up with the idea of selling Yosef, they ended up meriting to benefit the entire world because Yosef was sold to Egypt, and he provided food for the entire world during the years of famine. And, continues the Midrash, and, if through their sin they caused that the whole world should live, how much more so is the power of their meritorious acts? Or, as another great sage, Rabbi Achva Barzera, put it succinctly, the sin of the brothers became the hope of the whole world. And this is the inner meaning of the words they sat to eat bread. They fed bread to the whole world. So, like, even if you're sold up the river, who knows what God has in store for you, huh? Okay, you could see it that way. That's an optimistic spin on a sad situation. But at the same time, and here's where you really have to open up your heart in the deepest way, at the very same time that the sages make this observation, about how the brothers' action caused Yosef's descent into Egypt and thus facilitated the survival of the world during these seven years of very severe famine. 
at the very same time, the very same sages of Israel teach us that the sin of the sale of Yosef, the sin of the sale of Yosef was an act of such grave consequences, so horrendous, that it caused a ripple effect in the very fabric of the generations throughout the years. It caused irrevocable spiritual damage, such spiritual damage that it affects every generation, that it veritably needs, up to a point, continuous rectification. Thus, for example, we find later in history, in the years following the destruction of the Second Temple, that ten great sages of Israel, including the famed Rabbi Akiva, were executed, martyred with great cruelty, tortured to death by the Roman Caesar Hadrian, who declared to them that they were being killed as a punishment for and in the stead of the ten brothers of Yosef. So how do I understand these teachings? On the one hand, the brothers sold Yosef, and because of that, all the populations of that region survived the famine, since only Yosef was capable of providing. So that seems to have been God's plan all right, and it's a good thing Yosef was in place. He was in the right place at the right time. On the other hand, having nothing to do with God's plan and not being able to take refuge in that, they, Yosef's brothers, were personally culpable for the heinous, unforgivable, severe sin that they committed against their brother. They were responsible, and they bequeathed that responsibility to the body of Israel throughout the generations. Thanks a lot. So, there's a certain duality here. There's human agency and human intent, and there's divine agency and divine intent. There is double causation. On the one hand, the characters here are each acting out human concerns. They're acting out of, of their human concerns. Yosef boasted to his brothers of his dreams. His brothers reacted, they were jealous, and they sought vengeance for their perceived slight. On the other hand, Hashem is directing all these events in order to bring fruition to His divine plan, which He actually he actually, this divine plan, it will, it will immediately bring about sustenance for the masses of humanity affected by the famine, and ultimately it will set the stage for all of the nation of Israel's descent into Egypt. But this is in fulfillment of that which he already decided and told Abraham at the covenant between the portions, and it will eventually lead to Israel's redemption from bondage and to Israel's receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai as a nation. It all starts now. But open up your hearts in deepest way. The, these are two tracks. There are two distinct tracks. The two are not connected. They are mutually exclusive. Because Hashem will always see things through. What's His concern is His concern. But that doesn't exempt, exonerate, or excuse the individual for his own actions. And God's plan is not a limited liability clause for a person's folly. In other words, this is so deep. God's plan doesn't have anything to do with the bad choices that a person can make. An extremely important life lesson for each one of us. So there's Hashem, and there's a lot of things that Yosef and his brothers need to work out. Occurring as it does during Hanukkah, Parshat Miketz, our sages maintain numerous traditions that illustrate how various hints, various aspects and motifs of Parshat Miketz allude to Hanukkah. There's many symbolic interpretations. I won't go into them now because we've spoken of these things in the years past. But aside from these symbolic interpretations, there is a deep connection between our portion of Miketz and the essence of Hanukkah. And what it really, boil, really boils down to, there is a deep connection between Yosef's struggle to maintain his identity, his Jewish identity, in the midst of Egypt, and between our forefathers' struggle to maintain and to fight for the survival of their beliefs in the face of the onslaught of the Greek oppression. But perhaps the deepest Parshat Miketz connection to Hanukkah is also the simplest and it's staring at us. Look at Yosef. Look at his inner strength and his ability to focus on Hashem's presence and guidance in his life despite the suffering, 
the injustice and the turmoil that he was going through. Yosef saw his own life as a manifestation of the unity of Hashem in this world, the declaration of which and the belief in being exactly what our ancestors, the Chashbonayim, the, Chashbonayim, the Hasbonayim priests, were fighting for against the mighty Greek army in the era of Hanukkah. So the Greeks tried to convince Israel, force Israel, to accept that belief in the one God is an illusion, that only the physical and demonstrable knowledge was true. Yosef was able to correctly interpret Pharaoh's dreams and he was able to provide sustenance to the world because he knew that Hashem is the only true reality and all else is illusion. Back a few weeks ago in Parshat Vayetze, chapter 30 of the book of Genesis, we found something noteworthy and somewhat perplexing. If you recall, as soon as Rachel gave birth to Yosef, Yaakov was ready to leave Lavan though he knew that there would be a confrontation with Esav who wanted to kill him last time he checked. In all these years, he's hiding out with love. And immediately after Yosef is born, in that verse, suddenly Yaakov is ready to move. As the verse reads, chapter 30 and verse 25, And it was when Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Lavan, Grant me leave that I may go to my place and to my land. What happened to his concerns about Esav? which was the reason that he was harboring with Lavan all these years. Seems like something changed, a total shift now, now that Yosef was born. Indeed, that's so. Rashi tells us, Now the adversary of Esav was born, as it states, Prophecy of Avadya, chapter 1 and verse 8, And the house of Jacob shall be fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esav shall be stubble. And they shall ignite them and consume them. And the house of Esau shall have no survivors, for Hashem has spoken. Says Rashi, fire doesn't work without a flame to ignite it. When Yosef was born, Yaakov was ready to, com to, to demonstrate complete trust in Hashem and return. So, Yosef and the Hanukkah light, what's the connection? Yosef is the light. Or more rightly, as Ovadia prophesizes, Yosef is the flame. Yosef is the flame that ignites the fire of the house of Jacob to destroy the power of Esav, which is but straw. Yosef, with his steadfast inner strength, Yosef the survivor, Yosef who remains pure and even flourishes, resisting the temptations of his foreign environment. Yosef, who knew more clearly than anyone that despite appearances, and despite his circumstances, and despite what anyone might do to him, Hashem is with him. Yosef ignites the flame of Hanukkah. Yosef is the flame. Shabbat Shalom and Hanukkah Sameach.